The Board of Pharmacy Specialties annually offers two funding opportunities of up to $5,000 each to support PGY2 residency projects highlighting the impact of pharmacist board certification. This could include the impact of pharmacist board certification on improved medication-related outcomes for patients, perceived value of pharmacist specialization across key stakeholder groups, or the project may focus on the successful integration of board-certified pharmacist specialists into institutional credentialing and privileging processes. Today, I am pleased to introduce our guest, Dr. Charles Summerlin, who currently serves as the Pharmacy Manager of Managed Care and Human Resources of the UNC Health Department of Pharmacy, and Dr. Kayla Waldron, the Assistant Director of Acute and Ambulatory Clinical Services and Residency Director for PGY-1 and Health System Pharmacy Administration and Leadership PGY-2 Residency at UNC Health. Dr. Summerlin and Dr. Waldron were recognized as the 2020 BPS PGY2 Residency Research Seed Grant recipients for their research project titled Development and Implementation of a Standardized Process for Identifying Clinical Outcome Measures Impacted by Board-Certified Clinic-Based Pharmacists. Welcome, Dr. Summerlin and Dr. Waldron. Thank you. Excited to be here. We're so glad to have you with us today. Before we dive into your research, I'm curious to hear why each of you decided to become board certified. For me, there are a few different reasons I decided to pursue board certification. I'm a new grad, just finished residency last year. During the residency process, I wasn't sure what sort of role I was going to pursue post-residency, and I wanted to really make myself as competitive as a candidate as possible and really demonstrate my clinical expertise. Um, Despite being an admin administrative resident, I did do a traditional PGY-1 residency training and, and got all the clinical training uh, necessary to, to really be a robust clinical pharmacist. I wanted to have board certification to really represent that and, and validate that training. So for me, it was kind of personal satisfaction of validating that experience, but also bringing value and, and competitiveness to me pursuing positions post-residency, I would say, are the biggest reasons. And, and mine actually goes all the way back to pharmacy school. I remember one of my faculty members praising a few of our other faculty members who had just obtained board certification. And that it is, it was at that moment that I was like, yeah, that's it. That's something that I set as a goal from sort of that moment on and sort of never, never lost sight of it, even, you know, through the different, different paths that I ultimately took. But um, every time I think about it, it goes back to that moment in class of just sort of how proud he was. And it was then from then on something I wanted to achieve. That's a wonderful story, Dr. Waldron. Thank you for sharing. And Dr. Summerlin, I share some of those same sentiments as a newer practitioner myself. Before we really get into your research, I'm curious how board certification in general became an area of interest for research. We had identified really a gap in the research, I think, in a couple of areas. First, really related to specialty outcomes, and we felt like we had the expertise. And then when we drilled down into looking at some of the things that we felt were unique about our specific practice here, a lot of it was that advanced practice and that as part of being advanced practice providers within our organization, board certification is a piece I think that is critical in not only where we are right now, but in continuing our place as advanced practice providers. And so I think they kind of ended up, it it sort of ended up happening kind of at the same time when we were doing sort of this deeper dive and evaluation of something we sort of knew we wanted to look at were these outcomes, but then looking at some of the gaps and and what sort of made our practice unique. So it was just sort of this nice marriage of a couple of different elements that led us to looking at this. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that background. I'm curious how you then set your plan into action. It seems like there were pretty much two phases. The first phase being identifying the outcome measures to track the impact of board certified pharmacists and then developing the standardized reproducible process for identifying the outcome measures. Can you explain your methodology in a little bit more detail? Sure, I'd be happy to. So as you mentioned, Elliot, our two primary project aims were to, one, develop and refine a standardized reproducible process for identifying clinical outcomes measures that are impacted by board-certified clinic-based pharmacists. 
And I would say that is the primary aim of our project. And then aim two was to identify and prioritize clinical outcomes measures within four separate specialty clinic pilot sites, as you mentioned. So those are two primary aims, and I can go through the methodology in a bit more detail for you as well. We conducted a series of rapid cycle improvements utilizing the Plan View Study X, um, or PDSA framework. And again, we did this in four different clinics uh, in an iterative fashion. So these are the four clinics that were involved with the project. We started with cardiothoracic transplant and kind of piloted this process that we developed and then moved on to breast oncology, the neurology, and gynecologic oncology. Um, so these are the four clinics that were involved. And as we went along, um, again, we kind of made improvements as we, as we progressed from one clinic to the next, um, as we piloted this process that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a second. And at the end, um, I would say we confidently built out a robust um, process that can be utilized amongst other clinics in addition to these four. And again, we kind of used the PDSA cycle and, and made changes over time to get to this standardized process. I can go through more details about each step uh, within the PSA and kind of what we did to, to get there. So each of those four pilots on the previous screen uh, had three different phases within each of those. Um, so phase one uh, consisted of an environmental scan in which we identified potential outcomes, measures that we could potentially use for that clinic. And then phase two was the modified Delphi process. And phase three was, again, those rapid cycle improvements that I alluded to. So again, phase one was environmental scan. Uh, we did a deep dive of various literature and various resources, primarily quality measure databases, clinical guidelines, literature review of other studies that might have had outcomes measures that we could potentially utilize. And then the board certified client-based pharmacists often had really good ideas for other resources that we could use protocols and things that they were aware of that we may not have had as strong of understanding as, as they did. So kind of looked through those different resources and compiled a, a list of draft measures that we could potentially use to track for at least four different clinics. And once we had that list of measures, we worked through the modified Delphi process, which was phase two of each pilot. So we had a group of Delphi panelists, which was really key to, to the Delphi process. And we had five different stakeholder groups representing the Delphi panel. And those five different stakeholder groups are here on the screen. So the first one was clinic-based for inpatient pharmacists internally at UNC hospitals. And then second, we had uh, UNC non-pharmacist healthcare professionals. So these were you know, physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, physicians assistants, and so on, uh, to really capture the multidisciplinary perspective of what others might want us to be tracking to demonstrate um, outcomes. And then we had various leaders within the Department of Pharmacy, um, so Kayla, and then various managers and leaders within the department that oversee some of these pharmacists, and then specialty pharmacy stakeholders, and lastly, managed care stakeholders. So these were folks who could really represent the perspective of payers or PBMs, um, manufacturers, things like that, to really drive that perspective for our project. So these are the five main stakeholder groups that represented the Delphi panel and worked through those draft measures that we identified through the environmental scan. And I do want to highlight that we had several board certified pharmacists involved in the project, more than just in these two groups here, but 100% of the pharmacists within the clinic based and inpatient pharmacists and then the leadership stakeholder groups were board certified. So we have confidence that they were able to represent that perspective of the project as well, which we're very excited about. So those panelists uh, worked through three different rounds of electronic surveys to generate consensus around the draft measures that we identified in the environmental scan. We had them rate each of the draft measures on two core criteria, importance and feasibility. And we also have the opportunity to rate or provide comments on validity. But we determined that we would have core criteria using importance and feasibility to really calculate a composite score for each of those draft measures. So again, we had three different rounds. Round one was where they were rating each of those draft measures on importance and feasibility. We then looked through those as a project team and, and scored them, calculated the composite score, and removed the measure scoring in the bottom quartile. 
and presented that during round two to the DEFLA panelists. And they again rated the measures, any of the remaining measures on importance and feasibility. We did the same thing where we removed the bottom scoring measures and presented a round three survey. And in this survey, the panelists actually ranked the measures in order of their preference for us tracking or utilizing that measure on our final list. So two rounds of rating and importance and feasibility, and then one round of priority ranking. Kind of a high level summary of, of the Delphi process that we utilize. And through that, we kind of were able to develop the prioritized list of measures for each of those clinics. And phase three, again, was the rapid process improvements that we made along the way from clinic one to two to three to four. And we made small changes throughout all four of those pilots. And we did that through logging of different issues. We also had pilot assessment meetings uh, at the end of each of those pilots where we collected feedback regarding things that maybe didn't go so well or things that did go well that we would maybe want to continue or improve going forward. And when we identified a need for improvement, we did implement that for the subsequent clinics to have that finalized process that was on one of the earlier slides. So it was a very quick overview of the Delphi process and the different phases within each of the clinics. Wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Summerlin. I think most of us are familiar with the Likert scale and that format, but I was less familiar with the Delphi method. Are you able to describe how you decided to use this method? I would say we landed on utilization of the Delphi method as our, our primary method for the consensus section of this research um, or of this project. And I would say the first reason was we had some experience with it. I had been involved previously with a, a large project where we used Delphi methodology for consensus amongst um, our clinical pharmacist staff. And so that familiarity, of course, sort of had it top of the list as we were moving into Charlie's project where one of the big things that we wanted was a means by which to incorporate and really balance the input of numerous stakeholder groups. From the outset of this project, we wanted to look, really be sort of forward thinking, looking into the future of what might we want to ultimately do with a lot of this outcomes information once we had it and once it was really kind of running in the background and we began to pull it and began to report on it. And so that's what sort of led to the identification that there's multiple stakeholder groups that we would like to engage with as we looked at some of the opportunities for how we could engage those groups and sort of, again, balance their input. Delphi sort of rose back to the top of it for the methodology we would ultimately use. And Charlie has a really nice slide here that helped us sort of make some of that final decision on could we deliver on, could we really execute on the key elements of the Delphi methodology to ensure that when we looked to not only publish this, but take it forward to multiple groups that it could sort of stand up. And so we felt very confident that we could assemble an expert panel um, and that we had means for anonymity. And then also that we had a process that would be iterative that we would be able to, to use repeatedly. And then of course, consensus being the ultimate goal that of course sort of drove that as sort of a final selection criteria for this method. Now say we've done it with two projects and I think it's becoming a favorite, <laughs> a favorite methodology here for me. <laughs> Good. Thank you for that explanation. So you've talked about replicating it twice already. If there was another group of researchers out there who was looking to use this method, what elements would they need to keep in mind when replicating this process? So I think it'll be helpful to walk through um, some of the core results and tie that in as I answer the question. Because um, again, the primary result or aim of the project was to develop this standardized process um, that we refine over time. And we want to drive home a lot of those key decisions and key features that, that came along with piloting and, and making those improvements over time that I alluded to. So on the screen here are the two primary results of the project, um, I would say, which was one, the development and refinement of that standardized process. And I'll go into more detail on the next screen, give you a nicer snapshot of that picture there. And then the second primary result was really the qualitative data that we were able to collect over time 
regarding the improvements that we made from one clinic to the next. Um, so again, we had those pilot assessment meetings as well as kind of a log of different things that popped up throughout the course of the project that we monitored. And we really did a good job of keeping log of that and writing out a rationale for making implementation changes. And we think that'll be helpful for other folks from other institutions to utilize. We certainly feel that our process that we developed is robust and, and reproducible within other settings, but the intent of sharing some of these other improvements would be for them to really tweak or tailor the process to what might work best for their practice setting, because it's not one size fits all approach um, for this type of project. So we do want to share those improvements and modifications and, and things that we learned along the way. We'll move on to kind of giving a better overview of, of this uh, primary aim on the next slide and point out a few key things that I think are important to keep in mind. While I do think we can refine it within different practice settings, there are some core elements. Kayla mentioned some within the Delphi methodology that are very important. Another one that I would like to point out really ties into the pre-Delphi, which is up here at the top in terms of stakeholder recruitment. So the stakeholders are really the key part of generating consensus around the draft measures and, and making sure that we're able to narrow the list down to one that is prioritized and, and deemed important within the stakeholders. So I would really emphasize others to spend a lot of time thinking through the stakeholders. Uh, perhaps these five groups would be different for another practice setting but they should spend a lot of time thinking through who would be most appropriate within those different stakeholder groups and, and really provide a good expert input um, as they work through the project. I think that's probably one of the biggest um, takeaways from this slide that I wanted to share, but the visual here is really just a different way to view the, the methods that I shared on the previous slide, but this is the finalized process that we developed and just a nice summary of, of that that we walked through earlier. I do want to share um, a little bit about the secondary result, which was, again, the list of outcomes measures that we were able to identify through this project. I don't want to spend a lot of time going through specifics about that because, again, that wasn't necessarily the intent of the project. But I do want to emphasize that the process that we utilize um, can be used to identify different measures that can be used to demonstrate the value and impact of pharmacists within the different practice settings. And again, like I mentioned earlier, our practice setting at UNC might be very different from the practice setting somewhere else. And we don't expect others to utilize the measures that we identify within their setting necessarily. We, we would really encourage others to utilize that process that was on the previous slide within their own practice setting to work through their own stakeholders that they deem to be experts and work through that process and identify their own measures that would be appropriate to track and measure. And so I think that's probably the biggest takeaway is while everyone's very excited about the measures and knowing what was deemed important to, to be measured within our practice setting, it may be different for others. So I definitely encourage folks to utilize the process and make tweaks to, to their own setting and identify what is most important for their practice setting specifically. So I'm hearing that stakeholder engagement, stakeholder selection, very important components of this, and then making sure that it's not a one size fits all. It's very specific to the practice setting. Is there anything that you found particularly surprising or challenging as you were carrying out this process? I'd say one of the biggest surprises, actually tied to the slide here, was the response rates that we were able to achieve through the project. I feel like we were able to get very robust Delphi panelists and, and stakeholders involved in the project from several different institutions, not just at UNC, but elsewhere. And, and we're very excited with the response rates and the level of commitment people had um, into the project and their interest in it. I'm sure it helped with the stakeholder engagement that you mentioned, but also being able to utilize some funds from the BPS grant for incentives certainly helped with getting those response rates up. I would say folks did have a genuine interest in the project, and I knew it was an important project, but I was surprised at how involved and how interested people were um, in seeing positive outcomes come from this project. In terms of challenges, though, um, we're still navigating COVID, and I would say that was probably the biggest challenge with this project. Um, I had exciting plans to have in-person meetings or very interactive um, for the you know the pilot assessment meeting that I alluded to earlier. 
we had to modify that to utilize technology um, to do things via a virtual platform and figure out how to how to do that in, in the interactive way that we wanted to. And with COVID, we had to reprioritize other efforts and had to be very flexible with our survey deadlines and whatnot um, to be able to achieve such success um, in terms of the response rates and getting the, the responses and outcomes that we wanted. Continue to navigate COVID, obviously, but I'd say that was probably one of the biggest challenges throughout this project. I see on the screen here, looks like two of the clinics were oncology related, two were not. Where do you see this PDSA model being applied next, either within your health system or in the broader healthcare space? You know, as you kicked this off, um, it was clear this was a part of Charlie's residency project, and he's, of course, done, um, but we have not let this go by the wayside. So these four clinics are actually still engaged with us. We have a uh, another resident that has worked with each of these groups to take them through an implementation process. And, and so now um, all four of these clinics are concluding their implementation um, with really the goal that as they go forward a couple of years, because outcomes data can really take a while to accumulate correctly, within the next couple of years, they'll be able to start um, extracting that data and begin using it to either make changes within their practice and then definitely best case scenario, hopefully getting that out into their literature. Additionally, we have long wanted to do some somewhat of a similar process for our acute care side or looking at some of our inpatient practice. And so we have another resident who is working with us on that. Um, she's in the early stages of her two-year program. So we're just beginning sort of the enrollment process of, of who's going to come in but looking to somewhat replicate this and, and figure out what adjustments need to be made to, to do this on the inpatient side. And then finally, um, we have some engagement from the remainder of our clinic-based pharmacists, many who either wanted to be involved in this pilot originally or who, who since they have heard about it, are excited to get involved. And so we have looked at how we can take now that process and begin um, that Charlie built through his project and begin to take our staff through it in, in a stepwise process and really begin to apply it. So there is still a lot of energy and momentum around this. And we're just fortunate that we have a fair number of residents who can help us with it. <laughs> yeah, the residency project that never ends. That's yes. That's good to hear, though. I guess from a broader perspective, how do you think that this research, how do you think these findings will impact the future of pharmacist board certification? I think there are a lot of opportunities to impact the pharmacist practice and kind of the future of board certification. I think Kayla mentioned some opportunities for expansion of this process to other settings within pharmacy. We've seen a big push towards value-based care and really demonstrating the value of pharmacists and being able to share data back with various stakeholders, whether that be the managed care stakeholders that we alluded to earlier or, or other folks. And we've seen bigger and bigger push for that. And even within my role now as overseeing managed care at, at UNC, definitely seeing more and more requests for data and demonstrated value of pharmacists. But up to now, I, I don't think we've had a good way of figuring out exactly what they want us to share with them, what sort of outcomes should be tracked. So the biggest thing is leveraging this process that we developed and refined to be able to figure out what we should track and what we should measure and, and share out with those stakeholders. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things, but I think we can definitely tailor it to board certification and, and identify measures and outcomes for board certified pharmacists to really show the value of board certification and, and potentially the, the impact that specifically board certified pharmacists are having on these outcomes that are identified and, and prioritized. So like there are a million different ways we could leverage the, the process that we developed, but those are kind of the key takeaways that I, I had from the project. So you mentioned there are some newer residents working on research questions related to your project, but are there other future research questions you'd like to see explored related to pharmacist board certification? 
I mentioned that one of the reasons that we were interested in this, specifically our specialty clinic sites, was because our pharmacist designation as advanced practice providers. And it's really the standard amongst really all of our providers to obtain board certification in whatever their designated specialty is. And so I think there is some interesting opportunity to look sort of along that angle of whether there's um, either the perception when that board certification is, is a part of it and what contribution that makes or could have towards obtaining um, advanced practice provider status or, or whatever it may be within an individual organization. I think there's some sort of association there or a, a clear advantage um, and so digging into that a little bit more. And then, of course, we were focused here on the ambulatory side, but I think there are sort of very similar opportunities to look sort of along these lines in the acute care setting as well. And, you know, could that similarly be linked to potential advanced practice roles? And for me, it's really sort of focused on, on that advanced practice and what is that, that pairing um, help us sort of further that um, endeavor. Well, has your research been accepted for publication or any presentations upcoming now that meetings are starting back up in person? So we did submit our uh, manuscript for publication. We're hoping for good news soon that we'll certainly share with you if it is accepted. Just waiting to hear back on some revisions that we submitted recently. But we'll certainly continue looking for opportunities to share our research um, via meetings later this year, most likely, since things are now returning back looking forward to the end of COVID, as I mentioned, challenges with my research project and whatnot, but certainly looking forward to getting back to some in-person meetings and, and sharing some of these findings with other folks. A manuscript is quite the process, so congratulate you on your progress there and wish you the best of luck on your revisions. And it's really obvious the team has dedicated a lot of time and energy and thought into this research, and we do really look forward to kind of seeing its conclusion and and final outcomes. Thank you so much, both of you, for your time today. And before we sign off, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to share any final thoughts you'd like to leave our listeners with. I just wanted to say thank you to BPS for really supporting our project and allowing us to share some of our findings with you today um, and be able to support financially with the incentives to get such great response rates like are on the screen here. Definitely helped to provide a more robust research project, which I'm very thankful for. I definitely encourage other residents to consider applying for the, the grant. You never know what will happen. So I was happy to get good news when, when we applied. Um, last year. So I'm definitely excited to or encourage others to do that. And lastly, I do have a slide with our contact information. Um, I would be happy for folks to reach out to me directly if you have any questions about the project. Hopefully it will be published soon, but um, you can look out for more info there. But feel free to reach out to me or Kayla if you have any follow-up questions. But again, really thank you for your time and support of our project. It means a lot. Well, on behalf of the Board of Pharmacy Specialties and our listeners, thank you for your time today and sharing your research findings so far. Not only does your work demonstrate the value of board certification, but it also highlights the benefits that patients experience from specialized care. Dr. Summerlin and Dr. Waldron, thank you for sharing your valuable insight with our podcast listeners. We look forward to following along as you finalize the study. Listeners, we hope you enjoyed the conversation today. Be sure to join us for our next episode to continue learning more about board certification. For residents, residency program directors, or residency preceptors interested in contributing to the growing research on the benefits of board certification, visit the Seed Grant section of the BPS website to learn more. Be on the lookout for upcoming submission instructions for next year's grant process.